Welcome to Unite Now, where we bring unity to you, wherever you are. Today, we are going to talk about user acquisition tips and tricks and what we have experienced here at Unity. I am Baby, and I'm leading the performance advertising team here at Unity. And today with me, I have three user acquisition experts who are running their um, advertising campaigns with us. Why don't you introduce yourself and your company? Hi, hello everyone. My name is Tatiana. I head up the user acquisition team at uh, Graham Games. We're based in London and Istanbul. And besides our evergreen title 1010, uh, we have uh, Merge Dragons, which is an isometric puzzler. Hey everybody, I'm Conrad. I'm the director of growth at You Can Games, uh, where UA and monetization role or user acquisition and monetization rolls up to me at the studio. Uh, our big games right now are Jeopardy World Tour and Who Wants to Be a, Nil a Millionaire, uh, which are both uh, IP trivia titles. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Antti Bakkala. I'm the performance marketing lead at Small Giant Games. We are a, a Helsinki based studio that uh, is most famous for the title Empires and Puzzles, which is a uh, puzzle RPG uh, game. Great, right, thank you. So why is it that Unity is um, best uh, and suitable to talk about uh, best practices of user acquisition? First of all, Unity has global scale, uh, where we reach over 140 million users every day, which could be the users for your games. Um, then we have tons of advertisers across different game genres and different stages uh, of their game, which gives us a pretty unique view of seeing what works best for one genre, what works best for the other one, and what would actually be the uh, practices that you should um, use. How it's going to work today is that uh, I'm going to give nine tips, and all of these tips will be validated and discussed with our friends here um, to see whether I'm right or wrong. Um, so here we go. Here are our best tips to achieve user acquisition success at Unity and also across the board. So tip number one, let data do the work. When, when I say that um, platforms as big as ours um, have over 100, 114 million users um, that we could reach um, every day, there has to be algorithms in place that are actually going to find those users for you. We cannot really do lo a lot manually. So because of that, um, algorithms will find the best user uh, who is going to engage with your um, ad, right? So um, the m main tip point here is that when you launch campaigns, you should launch broadly. When I say broadly, I mean don't do any categorization. Don't think about um, the demographic or what your um, expected uh, people will be. So for instance, you might think that, okay, so my game will be most attractive for males and they are usually gonna come from, let's say, uh, mid or hardcore games. Sure, however, there might be some users who will come and will be the best payers coming from a casual game. You don't know that, but our machine learning um, algorithm will potentially find those ones. So for instance, um, on the right side here, this is an advertiser who uh, first launched in September in uh, one country. That was a soft launch. Then a month later, they launched um, in other countries also. And uh, as you see in October, where the scale is up, this shows that they did not do any kind of optimization on a publisher level. When I say publisher, that is the app that your users are coming from. So I'm going to call this publishers today. Um, and then they launched this in October broadly with lots of publishers run on network. That's how we call it. And then after a while, our systems learn where the users actually are. We stopped showing those ads to um, uh, users who did not engage with it and they've narrowed it down at the same time. The advertiser also started optimizing on a publisher level, um, and then volumes obviously drop, but this is how the best practice would be. What is the verdict on this one, please? Oh, I like it. This is a good start, people. All right, Tatiana, why don't you comment on this? Uh, definitely. So I completely agree. I think everything you've mentioned, especially true in a global launch scenario uh, that you gave, when it's very, very important to test all of the available tactics and strategies and placement, even you know, if you're not able to test everything, at least on a smaller scale, to really see what works. Because I think it's very crucial for us as uh, user acquisition professionals not to make assumptions about our audience of a new product or of a new market, because sometimes you can be surprised uh, by the outcome. And also, I think you inventory is so massive that it's very helpful when there's an algorithm that uh, you know does work behind the scenes to help speed up the process and help uh, the user acquisition managers avoid some of the you know grinding process that goes on in the background 
Mm-hmm. Conrad, you wanted to maybe add something here? Yeah, sure. Um, I think Titania's right as well, like always removing your personal data point and not letting your personal bias, especially if you're acquiring um, for a title that might be outside of your sort of personal interest. Um, the one thing, the one sort of caveat I'd say, um, or that I'd add on to is you always want to let data do the work, but I think you want to make sure that you have enough data um, and being mindful of, you know, whatever scale you're spending at, not spreading yourself too thinly across too, too many pubs and, and also j- or publishers and also sort of keeping that in mind, whether it's at launch or post launch, I think is always something that's important to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Auntie, did you want to comment? Um, I don't think I have anything specific to add to these, uh, these fine, fine uh, colleagues of ours. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. We need to, uh, begin with uh, basically the information we have. And if we don't have any information, then we need to go abroad and collect that and and let the data make the decision. Okay, I like this, thank you very much. All right, tip number two, use all of your levers with app level optimization. When I say app level level optimization, in the industry, we have um, terms such as whitelist, graylist, and backlist. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, you usually have like an average bid, meaning uh, the price per user that you're willing to uh, pay. Um, and I, I will call it cost per install, so the install price. So you will have this average there in, 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 in your mind. Uh, let's say that it's maybe $2. Then if you want a bit higher, some users coming from specific publishers are going to be worth more than the two dollars you're willing to pay that you bid higher for them that is called whitelist when you see some users that are not worth two dollars you will want to pay 150 or 50 cents or whatever that's called greatest but you don't want to fully block them because they still bring some sort of value and then the third option is blacklisting where you fully block a publisher from showing your ad now, so that is something that we uh, strongly encourage for you to do, uh, where you deploy a granular bidding strategy, because every user has a value. It might be one cent, but there is a value there. You should just bid accordingly. And uh, so, for instance, when you're on the right side, what you see here is um, impression levels over time per publisher. So on the top, you see impressions, and um, below, you see install price, the CPI per those publishers. These vary from one cent to ten dollars in one campaign, but they're all still ringing uh, impressions. So the main point here is that you should bid differently, have this um, strategy in place where you see the value of these uh, publishers, bid accordingly. You don't really need to block apps if you don't want to, uh, because they might still bring some users in. And at the same time, going back to my first point. The algorithm will just stop showing um, ads to those users who will not engage. So those will be also filtered out with low bits. What do you think of this one? Mm, okay, Tatiana and Dante said yes. Conrad, not so much. Let's start with Tatiana. Sure, I seem to a lot uh, agree quite a lot with you, KB. Like so it. let's see, let's see how it continues. Yes. Uh, so basically, uh, we don't usually block apps. As you mentioned, rather, we try to find the right price for each of them, whether it means, you know, bidding 10 cents or $1, et cetera, right? Uh, But the caveat to that is that you need to have scale, right, in order to have enough uh, data to make this analysis and also a robust BI or, you know, analytics tools to really make sure you monitor the performance and, you know, balance the ROI, uh, return on investment aspect of it versus discoverability, right? So it doesn't make sense, you know, for, for everyone to do it, right? And another thing is that we found that it's really important to refresh these gray lists, white lists, black lists, whatever, every three to four months to make sure that we're not missing out new sources and we're not stuck in a local maxima because the market does shift uh the publishers in question may change uh, their traffic quality so it's always important to continue learning and refreshing yep all right conrad you said no yeah there's a maybe um or, or really i'm just sort of conceptually arguing i think that at a certain point a gray list bid gets so low that the volume that you're getting from the publisher in question, you've effectively blacklisted them. I mean, other than that, I, I agree. Granular bid strategy, I think, is like foundational for running um, sophisticated user acquisition campaigns on rewarded video networks. Um, but I just think that there's sort of a point where you say, okay, 
the gray list bid effectively turns into a blacklist. So you, I think you are still doing blacklisting maybe by a different name, um, but just my two cents. Okay. Auntie, do you want to bring this back into my favor fully? <laughs> of course, of course, Larry. Um, yeah, we've we've uh, we've also noticed uh, with uh, with empires and puzzles over the over the years now that uh, Unity has such a broad swath of uh, different publishers where we could be buying uh, that the uh, granular bidding strategy really really makes a difference for us because we see uh, that for example the example that you showed of ten cents to up to ten dollars within the same campaign definitely uh, is something that's actionable and really is a make or break thing for the entire uh, operation in terms of profitability, in terms of really acquiring that uh, amount of users or scale that, that we're looking for uh, when we're trying to, to buy users profitably. And absolutely, uh, the more granular you can get, the better. And Tatiana to alluded to it as well, is that re this really requires your uh your back end your your bi system to be in in such a powerful place that it can absorb all of this data and you can make cohort based analysis on on all the different granular levels that you need to uh in, in to be able to make sure that you have good enough uh predictions in place good enough data in place so that you can drive this uh decision forward agreed thank you for that all right, tip number three here is to bid differently based on device components. Device components, basically when you think about um, your app and the devices that people play on this, these devices have very different features. For instance, is it a tablet? Is it a phone? Is it an operating system eight and above or is it something completely different? All of these things come to play when, it, uh, when there might be some quality difference uh, for those users. Um, for instance, when you think about a beautifully uh, graphic um, game, usually hardcore or midcore are, are more in, in that side, um, and they will look better with high-end devices. This might mean that some users also play and pay more in those high-end devices. If you see that difference, you should also bid differently. For instance, on the right side here, you see an IAP-based game. Um, this is just an example of how they have organized their user, uh, US um, campaigns. Um, and then, for instance, on the iOS side here, they have a separate campaign for iPad targeting, only targeting iPad with low uh, operating systems. Then another one here is iPad on 12 and above. These bit differences in these campaigns could be $1, $2, whatever, because they see that there is a quality difference coming from these users. Same, same time on Android side, you have um, these different types of um, campaigns. On Android, screen size and screen density called DPI is something that can really help you uh, narrow down when it comes to not doing um, device targeting per se, like Android device, uh, but also actually just the density. So highest density, higher DPI means usually that it's a higher um, end device, quality of users may be coming from there more. So um, bottom line is that if you see that the user quality is uh, different by device components, you should also bid differently. Thoughts on this one? Mm, okay, I'm not getting lots of love here. Okay, let's start with Conrad. Sure. Um, I think that for us, it's more important to sort of cut the long tail off. It's easier to identify when they're, whether it's a, a device or a screen size or an operating system that isn't driving enough value that we can, we can blacklist. For us, whitelisting on the other hand, being more aggressive on inventory, I think is something where we're a little bit, um, we don't necessarily have enough data to be really confident in, in some of those bids, but cutting the long tail off, I think, is something that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Okay, fair enough. All right, Tatiana? Um, so the reason I said kind of maybe, right, similar to Conrad, is that I think the challenge is having the internal data to track and understand the variance in performance right especially on something that goes beyond having an operating system but something that's connected to uh you know the screen density or potentially the memory right and it is but i do think it's still a very useful project to dig into and feedback to the game team so for example what we found right what uh, conrad alluded to blacklisting some devices we found out that actually giving 
uh, you know, feedback to our game team, help them fix some of the performance of some of these devices, and we're able to unblacklist and run. So it's actually quite important to understand what is actually the driver of the performance. Is it because the device is not strong enough in terms of memory to support the high quality of the game, or it's something else that's tied to the monetization? So I think the actual genre of the game also plays a role. So for more casual games, like for example, like ours, it may be less of a factor, especially something like, uh, you know, the screen density. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, IT? Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with uh, uh, with uh, my my esteemed colleagues again. Um, what I would add is that from, from uh, my personal view, uh, making decisions on OS and on device level uh, or operating system on device level absolutely makes sense if you have enough data to back that decision up. So again, uh, uh, this would uh, sort of call back to the uh, first question about letting really data make the decision uh, because the, it's, it's very um, sort of uh, easy to think about just focusing on the latest devices, only targeting the, the higher end ones, but you might be losing out on a lot of val volume and value if you're only going for, for that uh, end of the spectrum. And also, um, what I would also say is that it's, it's really important to have enough, uh, enough data to make that decision as well. So if you're making, uh, let's say if you only have uh, a low amount of installs on a daily level, that's also hard to really distinguish anything. So make sure to, to uh, stockpile that data and make that decision based on that. Cool. All right. So tip number four here is that 10% of increase in bids does not only mean 10% in increase in volumes. When, the, when you increase your bids, your ad will be shown to different new users because of the algorithm, and then the conversion rate changes. When I say conversion rate, it uh, is from impression to install. So how many people see your ad? We call it like impressions. Uh, and how, out of those ones, uh, how many will actually uh, install the game? Um, when you increase your bid, your like you will actually be shown to different users and that will also cause the ECPM to go higher. What is ECPM? ECPM um, is what defines uh, where you would be in the ad plan, how many people see that, higher ECPM, higher volumes. In Unity, we calculated purely CPI times conversion rate from impression to install times 1,000. And with the CPI increase, your ECPM will higher, you're gonna show to uh, different users. Now, for instance, here on the right side, this is um, in impression levels over time where you can see that this um, advertiser increased the CPI from $122 to $160. That is 31% uh, of increase, and it actually delivered 78% higher uh, amount of impressions. So basically, you don't know how much it's going to go because algorithms will put it into place, but um, keep in mind that the relationship to, uh, from bits to uh, volume of installs is not one-to-one. -one. Agreed? <sighs> I like this attitude. Conrad, go. Sure. Uh, I think this is a huge sort of non-starter for me. I think this is also something that maybe um, less experienced uh, advertisers may not always equate because simply it seems like it should make sense. Um, a 10% increase should also be a 10% increase, but that's not the case. Um, I think one. I think you described it pretty well. I think another way that I sometimes try to describe it to people um, would be if you think about the reverse side, so if you think about someone's waterfall that you're buying into, um, you know, you could take just a small bid increase, which would make your uh, overall acquisition much more competitive in their, in their auction, in their waterfall, and then unlock a lot more scale just by moving up just a small amount. Um, but overall, yeah, huge. I think this is really important. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, Tatiana, do you want to say anything? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I really agree with uh, Conrad. Um, I think it's common sense, right? And also, I think it's very important for user acquisition managers to really push themselves to understand the other side, the monetization side, to really see how the waterfall functions, right? So to do that at Gram, we try to gather all the information that is available, for example, ad brand reports, right, to really help us spot opportunities. This is where we see which position we're in, how much we need to bid more in order to get 
to the top ECPM that, uh, you know, that you described, right? What we also do, we have an internal dashboard where we take our top sources of traffic from which we're buying from each um, advertising network, for example, such as Unity, we call them hero publishers, right? And we track the installs CPI and profit that we make on each week. And we see if an increase or a decrease in CPI makes a positive impact. Let's say, did we increase the CPI by $1? Did the profit also go up or it didn't, right? And we make changes accordingly. And from this, it becomes very clear that it's not always, you know, 10% equals uh, 10%. And I think that really helps uh, our user acquisition managers understand um, uh, the very kind of volatile uh, dynamics of, of the monetization side. That's a good point. Yeah. Anki, you want to add anything? Um, that was a, a, another fantastic uh, uh, primer into into how important really the, the other side of things are, is. Uh, I would also like to highlight that uh, um, an increase in impressions that you will get does not automatically mean installs. And this really comes true for games that do not necessarily have a fantastic conversion rate, so your impression to install. So it's 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 very important to to make that or really open up that calculation of ECPM and what does it actually mean, and so you can uh, ahead of time sort of uh, prepare for what that amount of extra installs actually looks like when you're uh, making that, and that helps it uh, helps you uh, control your budget, helps you control your expectations of, of really increasing those amounts of installs and uh, it's it's just uh, another valuable part of, uh, of the day-to-day -day play. No, that's a good point. Thank you for adding that. Yep. All right. So now we're going get, to get into our favorite topic of creatives. So um, we know that we have to do a lot of optimizations on a publisher level and just like geo level and everything. But um, when I described the ECPM calculation before, um, a big factor there is the conversion rate. So how well uh, will the users um, will actually engage with your ad? You can get the price down and pay less for that user if you get the uh, conversion up, right? So because of that, the creative concept variations are extremely important. You have to make it very interesting and very um, visibly nice all the time. So because of that, um, my strong recommendation is that to really try different concepts and then just push out um, out of the box thinking and so on. So these are just one of the examples that um, you can try as one ad and like just different uh, ideas around it. So for instance, you can have real people in the video, but you can also have another video concept with real people playing the game in the video. Then uh, as you see on the right here from Empires and Puzzles, um, gestures that that is going to be different than just having a gameplay video you actually have the um, people tapping and so on um, so that's going to draw attention again um, and then you can have subtitles that is going to just tell a storyline when people are not listening or like playing the game with the sound on and so on so bottom line try very different concepts what's the verdict on this one okay Kind of figured that that would be the case. Um, okay, good. So, Tatiana, would you go first? Yes, of course. So, um, as you mentioned, I think creative is absolutely key uh, in our increasingly automated environment, where you know the algorithms are partially taking over, turning a bit more black box, right? And having the right combination, right, of testing and process becomes very crucial, right? So, what we do at Gram, right? Uh, we place a lot of emphasis on the actual process, right? Of how do we drive ideation, right? How, how do we get together with the designers to come up with these ideas? How do we test them? How do we hypothesize? How do we get, um, also deconstruct uh, videos, for example, that failed, right? And that drives performance altogether. And I think it's very important to connect both the um, art side of it and the science side of it. So what we do, right, given that we're all very data oriented, right, we have our internal uh, proprietary tagging system. So every single piece of creative that we make, we tag with a universal code. Um, and we send out the same code to every single uh, marketing partner that we work with. And this way, we're able to see um, all of our uh, data that we need, retention, return on investment down on the creative level. But then we go further, uh, we tag keywords. So for example, in our case, it would be red dragon, digital hand, blue background, right? To go even further, 
to understand what are the actual parts of the video that work and how do they influence various performance indicators. And I think that has really helped our designers understand what works and what doesn't and really drive experimentation and be able to, you know, uh, generate uh, tens and dozens uh, of ideas per week and put them into the testing mode. That is very impressive to actually have like keywords in place. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. All right, so Anki, do you guys do anything similar? What are your thoughts on this one? Um, well, as a Zynga member studio, together with Gram Games, we obviously talk to each other quite a bit in terms of the best practices of, of uh, how uh, managing creative should be done. And uh, we've definitely learned a lot uh, from Tatiana and her team over there. And uh, we're, we're similarly tagging the, the sort of uh, every concept with uh, a certain uh, certain style. This is not something that you, you need a, a massive, massive bureaucratic BI system for. You just need a, a very good process in place. You can even use a, a, a spreadsheet to, to highlight all of your different categories that you want to track and then just have those in order. And then when feeding that into your, your back-end uh, analytics system, it's, it's a very straightforward mapping process. So please don't hesitate to, to start with uh, creating these variations from even small things. Um, so that's, that's really the main thing that I would, uh, so that it sounds like a lot of uh, work, but if you do it very consistently, very often, absolutely you can get into that iterative flow very quickly. Okay, to be honest, I don't think I hear um, too many advertisers do that, but we're working with like hundreds, so. Um, I mean, that's a good point. It sounds scary, I would say, um, to like tag everything. Um, okay, so Conrad, um, like, do you have any comments here? Yeah, for sure. I, I think having a, a process-driven system and being able to iterate a lot and letting data drive those decisions are all super foundational um, and really important. And yeah, the tagging system is definitely a challenge. Um, so I guess what I would say here is that it's what I find interesting, especially about creative optimization and, and, and really iterating and, and coming up with new variations. It's interesting when you're working with, uh, with an IP title. So for us on, uh, on who wants to be a millionaire and then on Jeopardy world tour, you know, we have really strong brands that have, you know, a big audience and a lot of fans. So, you know, that kind of creates a box or gives you draws lines, certain places of, you know, things you can't do. Um, and things you can do. And I think it's interesting in how you sort of have to work within um, within constraints or, or just con creative constraints in general, I think are really interesting and in how you sort of optimize because there's certain things that you just can't do. And I think that especially with user acquisition, what we've seen over the last six, month, six months is um, advertisers, performance marketers really sort of pushing the boundary on what reality is and, and how big of a delta there's going to be between the experience of somebody who sees the ad and then when they install the game, they're like, ah, this isn't what I thought I was buying um, or, you know, buying meaning oh, this wasn't what I thought I was installing. So, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the things that I think about a lot uh, when it comes to creative. Yeah, kind of like keeping it true to the brand and... yeah. If it's necessary or not, it depends on the game again, right? Yeah, Makes sense. Um, Which actually leads uh, nicely to my next point uh, when you talked about also what is the actual, like the cycle and how to manage all of these things. So uh, my tip number six here is that we talked about concepts before, but you also need to be able to manage these um, concepts. So um, when you do manage these, you also cannot forget that you follow the performance not just the uh, kind of like the schedule that you have in place with your um, cycle. Um, okay, so it seems that um, IP has uh, disappeared on me. Uh, he got. It looks work. like you upset him. I think so. I think he got. I'm work. still here. I'm still here, guys. Okay, so just uh, uh, resetting, uh, resetting my camera. I'll be back in a in a second. Okay, uh, cool. So you, you've done done nothing wrong so far, Pavi. It's going, going great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So basically, the tip number six is that. Um, when you learn that um, data shows that one creative is um, lowering the conversion rate and is getting saturated, then, then that's the time to change it. However, you should always have this cycle in place because you can't just wait, oh, now it's like all of a sudden all my three good creatives are uh, lowering con conversion, I'm going to change them. So uh, the main takeaway here is, for instance, when you think about your type of app, 
um, casual games. They are more widespread. They are more people who would like to engage with them, but they don't last very long necessarily. And casual um, game uh, ads also, because they're so widespread, they might get kind of boring in a way. So um, our best practice is that the casual games or kind of like um, non-hard or mid-core games, you should uh, be ready to uh, change creatives in one to two um, intervals. And at the same time, mid and hardcore games, you have a pretty specific group of people will be, who will be engaging with your um, ads. Um, they will not see it so much. That's why your conversion is always lower than casual games. However, they're also like a bit long lasting. So four to six weeks is when you should like have this uh, cycle um, uh, scheduled. However, you might even have videos that are uh, best options for years. We call them evergreen videos. So again, it comes down to the point of do not uh, change creatives if you don't see them uh, getting uh, bad or like uh, like saturating. Um, do that only when you see the performance drop, but be ready for it. Um, and then one of the suggested process um, of any any of the kind of like managing your uh, rotation is that you brainstorm with your team, with your artists, with your uh, PMs. Then you put the concept that one um, into the queue, you test that one, and then you analyze what worked, what didn't, um, and then you iterate, and then you just do this constantly over and over again. Am I right or am I right? <sighs> okay. <sighs> this is so good, so easy. All right, who wants to go first? Why don't we start with IT? Well, of course, baby. Um, so basically, uh, I, I absolutely agree, and uh, and that uh, performance should be what's driving your decisions. We are, of course, in the performance marketing sphere, so it makes sense. Um, what we have seen is is absolutely what you're what you're describing. In that, uh, um, we're as a more sort of, uh, I think your quote was mid to hardcore game, unquote. Um, even though we, we are in this category, we try to be as approachable as possible as a product. And that means that we, uh, we should definitely be working on uh, a be a quite very different amount of concepts for empires and puzzles in order to find the ones that will then perform uh, long, for a very long time. And uh, for that to happen, we A, use the uh, creative concept variations discussed in the previous topic and tag those and analyze the data. Uh, and at the same, and then based on that, we make the decisions based on exactly what the data is telling us. So, which types of things work the best? Which iterations might have the, the highest conversion rate, etc. Uh, but what we've really found uh, over the last three years with uh, with empires and puzzles is that uh, the the main concept is going to be what uh, what dictates the m majority of your performance. And then iterating on that might have, might add longevity. It might add some, uh, on some publishers, for example, a, a slightly higher conversion rate. But it's really important to, to keep this testing loop going and especially new concepts is, is uh, what really will, will find that performance for you. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, Conrad, you said yes, but you, were, you had some hesitation there. It's true. Um, this is something, so full yes, um, but this is something that maybe we're guilty of not doing as much of um, on rewarded video networks. What, we'll, or what we've been sort of guilty of is uh, taking some of our winning creative from uh, like our largest channels, which are, you know, large social media networks, uh, if anyone can fill in the blanks and then running them on rewarded video networks. And I don't think that that's always the best practice, but sometimes that's um, sort of the hack that we'll end up doing. But I think that for the most part, you should be doing um, exactly what Antti described. Yeah, I mean, I agree that like basically like we have seen too that like it sometimes could work, but it sometimes wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, because the users we're talking about are different. They're not the same. Um, so that's, that's just the bottom line. You should always be mm -hmm. um, like making things happen applicable for the particular users from that platform. Um, but again, testing. Yep. All right. So we have talked about creatives. We have talked about how, what are the best practices to uh, launch campaigns. You're, we talked about publisher optimization and so on. Now, by the end of the day, all of we, all we want to do is get actually really good uh, engaging players into your game, right? So um, we should encourage um, 
to have more automated systems that make that happen. So at Unity, we have this um, post installing optimization um, campaigns uh, that is called Audience Pinpointer. And one of the things that you can do with that is uh, find users that are optimizing towards retaining users. Retaining users are users who stay longer in your game. So uh, this is a dynamic bit campaign that sees your real-time user behavior and finds similar retaining users. This is usually best for ads-based games because what your aim is to have a lot of users in your game that they are watching ads. You don't really have any in-app purchases maybe, so that's why it might work uh, better here because it purely optimizes towards finding other users who will stay in your game. However, it can benefit IAP in app uh, purchase based games, as there is maybe a correlation between users you retain and who, users who actually will pay, right? Because they're in the game longer and they will actually pay. So on the right side here, you can see that um, this is installs per campaign type over time. Uh, the blue is the so-called static campaign, meaning that you uh, optimize on a publisher level. You give us one bid, and that's what is going to happen. Um, and then the, uh, the yellow is retention optimizing campaign, where that you're going to give us a bid range, you're, uh, and we will find those users for you who will be retaining more likely, and so on. But the key here is that they're all giving you additional scale, different value, different price points probably, but different, uh, different scale. So how do you feel about um, this one here? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start with the one who said yes, I think. Uh, Pagi, you can do no wrong. Um, on, on, this, uh, on this topic, I'd say that uh, especially ad-based games that really monetize uh, strongly on, uh, on engagement, meaning session time, session length, amount of sessions, uh, really benefit from the signals that uh, Unity is able to collect and then use uh, in products like uh, Audience Pinpointer here. Um, while uh, it hasn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that this product is for everyone. So, for example, if your game uh, predominantly monetizes on in-app purchases, uh, like Empires and Puzzles, for example, uh, there are other alternatives out there. But if you're really looking to to uh, monetize on the time spent um, within the app, uh, then then uh, this is the product for you. All right, Conrad. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that I um, believe the hype, uh, but because most of the titles that we're running user acquisition for are primarily an app purchase based. Um, so I, I can't say firsthand experience, but I believe the hype. Uh, <laughs> conceptually, it makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate that. Tatiana, what do you think? Uh, yeah, similar to Conrad, we're definitely willing to test everything, and it's very interesting to get those uh, learnings and potentially it might open up inventory, but not as excited as some of your other special products, right? Special products. Thank you. Okay, that leads us to the other one that we're talking about. So the previous one was talking about uh, optimizing towards the retaining users. Uh, the second option at Unity is, uh, from Audience Pinpointer, is optimizing automatically towards uh, ROAS users. ROAS is a return on ad spend because you always want to pay less than you actually uh, make back. So this is another dynamic bid campaign that uh, finds your bayers based on your ROAS target. So you give us a target of your return on ad spend uh, percentage. Um, and then based on the uh, real time um, users that we see that come into your campaigns from the regular campaigns, the scale campaigns, from the uh, retention campaigns, we will find more of those users and target them here. Now, this is a very tricky one here though, because as we all know, there are still very limited amount of uh, users uh, and players in games that want to pay anything. I think it's still around two to 3%, right? So because of that, they're a bit harder to find. So the best practice is to just not start thinking about, oh, I'm only gonna get those users from this uh, category of games. Don't do this targeting. Let the algorithms work again to find these uh, users who will actually uh, make those uh, payments in your game in your game. So the scale will be lower because of that, but the value is higher. So quick example on the right here. So uh, this is again installs per campaign type over uh, time. So uh, on this one though, it is interesting that the ROAS campaign is the uh, pink one and the static campaign is the other one. And it actually over, uh, it, it gets more volumes and installs uh, per campaign type than the static one. 
this is probably just a very uh, widespread uh, IAP based popular game so that it actually makes this work. How is your experience um, with this type of game um, uh, campaign? Yes, ah, I like it. All right, uh, let's go with IT again. Uh, sure, absolutely. So um, here with uh, with this uh, audience main partner product for ROAS, uh, it, uh, it really, really uh, leverages the ability of of, uh, of the uh, width of Unity's publisher base to really find those users that uh, can can be uh, of high value for your game. Um, what really is required for for this to to uh, happen are basically two things. One is uh, you really knowing what your payback goals actually are and what your expectations are from a return on ad spend basis. So make sure you have uh, your, your uh, a BI in place. Make sure you have the uh, sort of buy-in to have a certain amount of, of return on ad spend on, let's say, day seven, which tends to be the, uh, the point of optimization for Unity. And then at the same time, uh, to make sure that you're uh, able and willing to actually pay a bit higher CPI uh, to be able to reach that goal. So, for example, in the uh, in the ROAS campaigns of Unity, you set a maximum bid as well as a uh, a uh, day seven ROAS goal, and don't hesitate to to give that maximum bid a lot of space. So maybe up to four, or maybe even five times higher than your your average CPI in the uh, in the uh, uh, more granular bidding campaigns. And uh, that's just something that we'll have to sort of take that leap of faith and and make it work for you. But uh, it can really get good results if you have a high amount of uh, in a purchases. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Connor, uh, what is your experience with that? Yeah, I think that they're. Uh, I think they're. I think they're great. Um, definitely can speak more positively to them rather than the retention um, pinpointer. I think that a big thing. Um, a, a big thing for them is making sure that you also have you know additional campaigns running. Volume is really important. You know, any event-driven um, optimization needs events. The more events, the better. Um, so I would say is that it, this isn't a question of like, oh, well, I'm only going to run the campaign type that's going to be the most profitable. Um, the profitability is going to be connected with the volumes that you're bringing in through the other campaigns. So not having um, one or two of the other ones running at the same time is going to negatively uh, impact your overall performance. Right. Tatiana, anything to add? Of course. Well, first of all, I agree with both uh, Antti and Conrad. It is a fantastic product. And I do think that it sets Unity apart from some of the other uh, uh, rewarded video ad networks, right? In, in having, you know, very kind of successful audience pinpointer, right? Um, and especially if you're able to be patient with it, like what Antti was describing, right? Um, having the right system um, waiting for you know enough time to have the system to learn from the run of network campaigns, setting the right expectations for it, you know, and also not stifling it too much. Because in the end, the goal is to find the right balance, right, between the discoverability in the run of network campaigns versus the high quality use of of, of the R, of the ROS campaigns, right. And in the end, I think this strategy, if you know, executed properly can be uh, very, very successful for, you know, for all the game developers. Nice. Uh, you're literally taking words out of my mouth. So my last tip actually literally says this, what you just said, um, that you should run all the campaign types uh, simultaneously. The scale campaign where you would uh, optimize on a publisher level and scale level, then audience pinpointer retention campaign and ROAS campaign. So because like we talked before, every user has this different value, right? And when you learn the value, um, you want it a bit differently. And this automation should do it for you. Um, and then um, why not just have that specific goal in mind, different expectation in mind, and just go, go in with different bits, different uh, caps, which means that you are, what is the price that you're willing to, what is the budget that you're willing to uh, pay every day for these campaign types? Um, and then this, all of this helps maximize access to users. 
that is the bottom line. You need more users. So for instance, on the uh, right side here, you see all three running at the same time installs uh, over time, over five months. So the blue one is uh, regular scale campaigns, the uh, yellow is retention campaigns, and the pink is uh, uh, ROAS campaigns. Actually, it's vice versa. Uh, anyway, so they went live with uh, uh, static campaigns, and then they went live with ROAS campaigns and retention campaigns. And as you see, the first November uh, spike is majority is coming from static campaigns. And then in January, the volume is almost back to the same level, but coming from different um, campaign types, meaning that they probably got also better volume uh, quality out of all of these because you have different expectations, different uh, bidding strategy, and so on. I think I know what you're going to say here. Tell me. Yes. All right. <laughs> Conrad, do you want to go first now? Sure. Um, yeah, I think you, you pretty much summed it up. I think this connects to my previous point, uh, saying that you need volume um, for the event-based campaigns to perform. And I think static supports that. Running everything, you sort of get, uh, yeah, you get the benefit. All right, Tatiana. Uh, yes. And one point to add, especially which is evident in your graph, is that how much each campaign type can feed off of each other and, you know, help um, succeed right especially they're on a network and ROS so you definitely need to test all of them right and to see what is the right combination um, and another note is that uh, you know gaming industry you know is very turbulent very fast changing and I think the setup allows us as a company to be flexible in case our strategy changes right let's say all of a sudden we need more installs as opposed to return on investment or traffic changes. Like for example, right now, uh, unfortunately the coronavirus changed not only the behavior of the users who are stuck at home and looking for games to entertainment, but also the availability and you know, the, the eCPMs. And finally, you know, um, there's been significant industry shifts, like for example, the presence of hyper casual, right? Which is also affecting the way that we you know, approach our user acquisition campaign. So this definitely helps us be able uh, you know, to, to find balance and also have a robust campaign strategy so we prepared for whatever may come. Yep, that's a good point. Ainti, any final comments? Uh, yeah, I, I could just add that uh, I think the, uh, the, the uh, chart that you showed uh, fairly accurately uh, describes, for example, the importance of, of uh, these different types of campaigns, and that uh, not the install, not all installs are made equal. Um, and uh, really, for for the amount of uh, of uh, fawning that we did in the previous topic over the ROAS product, the the drawback there might might be that uh, sometimes it is hard to actually find that amount of installs that you get decent amount of uh, sample size that you, you can be mathematically viable to make certain decisions on, on your end. So, and for that, you then have the, the uh, uh, products that uh, are able to give you more, more volume of installs. So uh, it's a really uh, good complete suite to, uh, to take into account. True that. All right. So now we're getting to the, we're done with the nine tips. Um, just to summarize here, um, tip number one, you should let data do the work where you start broadly to enable the systems to learn and then make optimizations when learnings come in. And then when you have app level optimizations, you should use all of your levers when it comes to whitelisting, blacklisting, graylisting, and um, to keep in mind that each user has a value um, and granular bidding enables you to buy based on that. At the same time, uh, you should also bid differently based on device components if you see that there is a quality difference in a, in a user coming from different components. So um, this works best in mid and um, hardcore games um, and as it, the quality actually relates to player um, behavior. And at the same time, 10% increase in bids does not only mean 10% increase in volume. So um, just keep this in mind. That is the main thing, that the bid and impression increases are not one-to-one -one when you're actually making those optimizations. Now, uh, when it comes to creatives, um, use very different concept variations um, because your strategy varies by game, your testing method varies by game, but everybody should have a process in place. Now, even if you have that process in place, do not forget to follow the performance, not just the process. So you should have a fresh uh, refresh cycle in place, but you will follow what actual um, creative um, uh, saturation is uh, showing you. 
Now, to make all of our lives easier, we should have more of these automated um, optimization tools. Then the point A here is you should use it. Run retention campaign uh, campaigns. So this, as we discussed here, is um, these work great for ads-based games uh, because the retaining users are broader there, uh, but they can provide value uh, when it comes to uh, getting more scale for IAP-based games. Now, love the attitude about the ROAS campaign, um, but also just keep in mind you can run it, but this strategy is very competitive, uh, definitely worth it, um, and um, mainly works best for IAP-based games, um, but the volume can be tricky as paying players are limited. And to sum it all up, tip number nine is that you should run all of these campaign types together so you're getting scale, you're getting retaining users only, and you're getting uh, return on ad spend users uh, only. Because at the end of the day, the more users and more data you have, the better it is for your games. Thank you so much, Tatiana, Conrad, and Antti for um, uh, talking about this here. We have lots of um, kind of comments, probably, questions. We have so much more to add. Uh, so for instance, uh, you can, uh, when you want to start uh, working with Unity, um, reach out to us at unity.com slash acquire. Um, at the same time, in the uh, Unity Learn sites, we have a specific uh, learning course called Growing Your Mobile Game that is um, focusing on monetization and user acquisition. Go check out um, that one too, and I appreciate your time. <laughs>